Any dollar? George Reed here. Georgie, how's Floyd's of England holding up this hot weather? Fine, Johnny, fine. Tell me, does the name Franklin P. Franklin mean anything to you? No, I can't say that. Oh, no, wait, wait. You mean the World War I fighter pilot who made such a name for himself came from right here in Hartford? That's the one. Oh, sure, one of my boyhood heroes. Yeah, Frankie the Flying Fool, they called him. Yes. Big plaque over at the library about the couple of dozen enemy planes he brought down. Yes. Which was quite a record in those days. Yes, Johnny. Something of a legend, too, because he gets shot down one day, be right back in the air the next. Yes. Just didn't know when to quit. Well, he isn't still alive, is he? No. Well, I didn't think so. No, Johnny, Mr. Franklin died a few days ago. Only a few Leaving days? a considerable amount of life insurance. With our company, of course. Oh, I see. Over $110,000 that's to be divided equally between his two sons, Randolph and Philip. Or, of course, the survivor. Oh, uh-huh. well, what's your problem? Well, Randolph is no problem. He lives right here in Hartford. As a matter of fact, he buried his father. But we need to find Philip. If, that is, if he can be found. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, suppose you come on over here to the office and I'll tell you what I know. Sure, why not? <laughs> CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Twisted Twin matter. Floyd's of England hands me some pretty screwy cases, but I love them because they always put money in my pocket, sometimes plenty. So, expense account item one, $1.10 for a taxi over to George Reed's office in the big new building on the square. Yes, Johnny, as you mentioned over the phone, Franklin Franklin was one of the wildest, most daring aviators in all of World War I. Yeah, from what I've heard and read about him, flying and fighting was a kind of obsession with him. That's exactly what it was, an obsession. It was more than that. It was a, a mania. Yeah. They simply couldn't keep him down. They could blast his plane out of the sky, fill him full of lead, but within a day or two, he'd be back up there fighting again. Yeah, must have been a real nut about it, huh? That's almost an understatement. So what about him, George? Well, a few days before that war ended, flying through a storm on the way back from a mission over Germany, he crashed into a mountaintop. Not from enemy fire, mind you. He'd shot down three Fokkers that day single-handed, but because of his own wild miscalculation. Yeah, but it didn't kill him. No, but he was badly injured. Very badly. Didn't regain consciousness for days. When he did, when they told him he'd never be able, never be allowed to fly again, well... Johnny, the man literally went out of his mind. No kidding. If it hadn't been for his family's money, Franklin would probably have spent the rest of his days in a mental hospital. Hmm. Kind of a shame for a man like that. Well, you must remember that even from childhood he was a pretty erratic... uh... Well, anyway, after a few years of expensive medical and psychiatric care, he apparently recovered both physically and mentally. Good, good. He was able to manage the estate his parents left him and marry and raise the two sons I mentioned, the twins, Randolph and Philip, now his sole heirs. Mm -hmm. What about his wife? Their mother, Grace Franklin, died when they were born. Oh, I see. Twins, you say? Yes. Identical? Absolutely identical, in appearance. What do you mean by that? Well, Johnny, they both inherited some of their father's instability. Now, you'll see what I mean when you meet them. That is, if you do meet them both. Yeah? Now, Randolph, living here in Hartford, is a salesman. He's on the road for a big machine tool manufacturer, and so far as we know, doing all right. Uh And Philip? From what little we know about him, Philip, the stupid one, well, the last we heard, he was a a henchman, I guess you'd call it, Uh of a man named Carlo Fazzetti. Fazzetti? Yes. The mobster up in Chicago? Yes. (laughs) I had some mighty unpleasant dealings with Fazzetti one time. Well, have you contacted him, asked him what he knows about Phil? No. Gee, Carlo Fazzetti. Yes. Oh, that's bad medicine. I realize that. But if the company's willing to pay good money for it, I'll try to make contact with him, see if I can enlist his help for a change. So? It may not be necessary. Oh? And your important contact will be Randolph. Okay. Because according to him, Philip died about a year ago. Okay, then I'll... Oh? Yes. Well, in that case, George... But he hasn't been able to give us any proof. And that, of course, is what we must have, proof one way or the other. Well, Johnny? Uh, there's a fee on this one? 
I mean, after all, if I should end up having a tangle with Carlo Vazetti. Your usual commission on the face value of the policy. And expenses? And reasonable expenses. Okay, Georgie, here we go again. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Charlie, the doorman at Randy Franklin's apartment, might better have been named Gimpy because of his mental limp. Is that Mr. Franklin? Geez, I don't know. You don't know? Well, how should I? Well, he does live here, doesn't he? Sure, part of the time. Huh? Sure, he's a traveling salesman, some tool company. Yeah, well, ring his apartment. Mister, he's out of town just as much as in. Sometimes a couple of days, sometimes a month away. Yeah, okay, time. now, will you please... Man, ring... what a life. That's what ought to get me, a job like that, traveling all around. Uh, ring his apartment, please. You See think if he's I in... like this? This standing around this fancy dump in his hot uniform. You think it ain't hot this kind of weather? I'm sure it is. Now, please, Boy. if you'll just... When I think how I could be traveling around all over, seeing the sights, meeting a lot of good-looking dames, showing them all a big time... Charlie, would you ring Mr. Franklin's apartment and see if he's in? You think I ain't responsible enough to get as good a job as Mr. Franklin or anybody else? Huh? Ring up his apartment? That's right. I can't do it. Can't do it? What do you mean you can't? A phone got busted a couple of days ago, and I forgot to call the oh. repairman. But like What's I was saying... What's the number saying, of his apartment? A 4A in the fourth floor. But like I started Okay, to say, thanks. Yeah, well, like I was saying... Me, I could be... Wow. Wait. Randy Franklin was in. He was mid-30s, maybe, tall, rather good-looking, with black hair, gray eyes. But there was something about the way he used those eyes, a funny shiftiness about them. And he was nervous, terribly nervous, with a trick of twitching his head so quickly I almost expected his neck to snap. His handshake was warm and friendly enough, though, but uh, his hands trembled. He drummed his fingers on the arm of his chair and kept adjusting his tie, touching his forehead, running his fingers down the edge of his jacket. Of course, I wish you could find Philip as a dollar, but uh, you can't. Well, you seem pretty sure of that, Franklin. I am absolutely sure. Uh, Philip is dead. It happened about a year ago, and, and Mr. Dollar, it was my fault. Well, now, why do you say that? Well, Philip lived in Chicago. He worked, for, he worked with a man named Carlo Vizzetti. So I've heard. You, uh, you know who Vizzetti is? I've met him. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. Then you can understand why Dad was, Dad was very disappointed in Philip. And when he became sick and Philip couldn't come here to see me, well, it was about that time I had to go to Chicago on business. I, I ran into Philip, and I, I told him, that Mr. Dollar, I, I told him that unless he came back here and squared things with Dad, got himself a legitimate job and settled down, Dad would cut him out of his will, out of the insurance. Oh, is this true? Yes, I believe Dad might have cut him off. Well, now, it seems to me... That would have been to your advantage. Thank you, but I prefer to get along on my own, which is why I wish you could find Philip now. But you can't. Yeah, yeah, you said that before. Of course, a share in Dad's estate, of course, I'd welcome that. But not all of it, if it meant cutting off my own brother and... You, you look as though you don't believe yeah, me. Well, just, uh, just keep talking, Randy. The point is, the threat of losing some of the estate persuaded Philip to fly back here with me to see Dad. But then, then, Mr. Dollar... Yeah. Well? Mr. Dollar, I... Look, are you... Are you always this nervous, Randy? No, it's just... It's just when I think about what happened, then it was such a, a frightening, such a, a terrible... Such a shock well, to me, I... I don't think I'll ever get over... Well, when what happened? Probably, probably accounts for the, these, these lapses, the, these blackouts that occur. When I can't remember things, lose track of things weeks at a time. When what happened, Randy? The, the airplane, unscheduled, we ran into a storm over the Alleghenies. We, we crashed into a mountaintop. Oh, I see. Do you? Do you really? Do you know what it meant? The same kind of a crash that years ago caused Dad, caused, caused my dad. Yeah, to lose his sanity for a while. No! You mustn't say that. He was as sane as you and I. It was just the fear, the terrible, un uncontrollable fear and the shock. Only three of us, so far as we know, managed to crawl away from the wreckage. The pilot, the little girl, and myself. Even we, and we were badly injured, we didn't know about each other until much later. Because we'd all crawled away in, a different, in, in different directions. When I was found, I'd been unconscious for, for several days. Hmm. 
Like your father after his crash during the war. No. Please. Don't. Please. All right, I'm sorry. They found Phil's remains in the wreckage. The wreckage of that plane burned completely. That is why the morbid-minded men at your insurance company can never have the sort of proof they seem to want. Poor Philip's body. Oh, I see. In any event, though, it looks as though you're the sole beneficiary of your father's insurance. And I tell you, I don't care. Don't you understand that? If you like, I'll give Philip's share to some, some charity. Randy, give me the name and address of the company you work for. Why, it's in New York at the... Oh? Why? Because I've suddenly got a real crazy hunch. Real crazy. Don't... Don't use that word. Okay, then. I got myself a real wild hunch. How's that, huh? Yeah. Instead of going on back to the insurance company and telling them to pay off this policy to you, the sole survivor... Yes. Yes, Mr. Dollar. Well, Randy, I'm going to continue my search for your brother. Search? For Philip? After all, I've just finished... Are you serious, Mr. Dollar? I sure am. But I told you... Yeah, you told me. Just... Stick around, Randy. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Twisted Twin Matter. Expense account item two, thirty-eight twenty for a day in New York, locating and checking with the machine tool company that Randy worked for. Well, by the time I got back to Hartford the next morning, I'd learned plenty about him. He'd been a good salesman for him for years, but not lately, not since the plane crash. And he never had a satisfactory explanation for long absences from his job. They were seriously considering dropping him from the sales force. Now, in other words, he had uh, plenty of use, maybe need, for his father's insurance money. All of it. Despite what he told me. So maybe if Phil was still alive. But when I went over to Randy's apartment again, he wasn't there. Okay, then. Item three on the expense account is 5210, plane fare to Chicago. Items four, five, and six are 30 cents for telephone calls to my old underworld contact on, uh, well, an ex-arsonist by the name of Smokey Sullivan. Item seven, 100 bucks cash to Smokey when he dropped me off at Carlo Fazetti's hangout, which, as might be expected, was an exclusive apartment out near the Ambassador East. What uh, I didn't expect was the man who opened the door. Yeah? I want to see Carlo Fazetti. My name is... Randy. Huh? So this is the answer. What are you talking about, mister? Oh, now, don't give me that, Randy. So you've been playing it both ways, huh? You ain't making no sense, Buster. So go on, get out of here, get lost. Oh, now, just a minute there, Randy. What's this Randy stuff? My name's Phil. Phil Franklin? Oh, you know, no, get out. Uh, just a minute, Phil. Who is he? Should I know, boss? It's jerk. He comes in here Dollar. and starts to talk. Well, <laughs> my dear old friend, Johnny Dollar. Huh? Old friend, huh? Why, of course, since you can't possibly be trying to tie me in with some of your insurance trouble. For once, was that <laughs> Come in, Dollar. Come in. Yeah, sure. Ah, Phil. Yeah, boss? Make an extra one of them drinks for Mr. Dollar here. My old friend, Johnny Dollar. Okay, boss. Whatever you say. Now, wait a minute. Yeah, I want to talk. Ahead, Phil. Yeah. Uh, sit down here, Dollar. Right in here. <sighs> that's, uh, that's Phil Franklin, huh? Yeah. Don't be Phil Franklin. You sure of that? Of course I'm sure. He's been with me for years, off and on. Off and on, huh? Yeah, one of my good boys once, but now, uh, I don't know why I keep him around. Say, listen, Did Fetty. I say keep him around? <laughs> Half the time he's here doing odd jobs around the place, serving the booze, helping himself to it. Half the time I get the boys out looking for him. Sometimes he's gone two days, sometimes for weeks. Wait a minute. Yeah, Wait he used to be one of my good boys. But ever since somebody knocked him on the head about a year ago... <laughs> See, he cracked up in an airplane. Oh, he did, huh? Hey, now, what would Dopey Phil be doing aboard an airplane, huh? Here's your drinks, boss. Here. Ah, that's the boy. Oh, Dollar. Why'd you come here to see me, huh, pal? Only uh, uh, drink up first. Here, Carlo. Just add this drink to yours. Huh? But if you don't mind, I'll hang on to this glass. No, wait a minute. Sorry, I gotta get going. What? See you next time I'm here in Chicago. Wait a minute, Maybe. Oh. I wrapped the highball glass carefully in my handkerchief, stuffed it into my pocket, then spent item eight, four ninety for a taxi. Item nine, another fifty-two ten for a plane ticket back to Hartford. Item ten, a buck and a half for a cab to my apartment. Well, there I picked up my car and drove over to Randy's place. He wasn't there. 
Item 11, $10 to the doorman, Charlie, to keep his eyes open for once and to phone me when Randy came in. And to keep his mouth shut. Well, as I might have expected, Charlie's call didn't come until five days later. Item 12, 485 for a tank full of gas. At police headquarters, I picked up Lieutenant Tim Waverly, who spends most of his time in the lab not in uniform. I gave him the highball glass, some instructions. Then together, we drove over to Randy's apartment. And this time, he was in. Yes? Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, that's right. You've, uh, you've been away, Randy, huh? Away? Oh, well, why, yes, I guess I have. Yeah, I guess so. Oh, Tim Waverly, a friend of mine, Randy Franklin. I am, Mr. Franklin. How do you do? Just, uh, just where were you, Randy? What does it make any difference? Where? Well? Well, Mr. Dollar, I, I don't know. No, no, I'll bet you don't know. All right, let him see it, Tim. Sure. Uh, Mr. Franklin, have you ever seen this glass before? Here, take it. What? I said, take it. Here. All right. Well, have you? No, I can't say that I have. Okay, thanks. Let me have it back. Well, of course. Here. Want to take it back to the lab, Tim? The lab? No need to, Johnny. These prints are identical, all right. Mr. Dollar, what's this all about? Randy Franklin, huh? And Phil Franklin, too. What? Yeah. So ever since that plane crash, huh? Please, don't talk about that again. Oh, oh, sorry. Afraid you'll get all nervous, all upset again? Yes, yes, don't you see? This this last blackout was right after you were here before. Blackout, huh? Yes. You expect me to believe you don't know where you went, where you've been ever since then? It's true, Mr. Dollar. Are you kidding? I saw you in Chicago posing as Phil. No. What do you mean, no? It's not true. It can't be Those true. identical fingerprints on this highball glass prove it. I, I don't know what you're talking but about. But why? What kind of a racket were you trying to pull? Dollar. Did you have some wild, some... Crazy no. idea that maybe, no, just maybe. No, don't talk like that. I told you not to talk like that. Do you hear All me? All right, now, you just keep your hands to yourself. No, Randy. because you're trying to upset me again, but I won't let you get out. Get out not of here. Just a minute, Watch you. Watch Johnny. I'll show you. Coming here this way. You hear me? No. Oh, no, you don't. Oh. All right, now, Randy. No. Please, please. Take it easy, Johnny. You hit him pretty hard. And that isn't all, Tim. Let me have your gun. My gun? Yeah, give me. No, wait a minute. Thanks. All right, now, Randy. Johnny, you're out of your mind. Am I? Stand back. No, Johnny. No, please. No. No. Johnny, if I didn't know you... Okay, okay. It was a shock that knocked him out, Tim. I know. You not only didn't hit him, you didn't try to, but yeah, I Yeah, that's right. Now, let's get him over to old Doc Parsons. Dr. Parsons? Yeah. The psychiatrist? Yeah, come on. Give me a hand with him. Then, Doctor, it was a guilt complex that brought it all about, huh? This condition of his. Plus shock, Mr. Dollar. You see, Randolph had built up this complex as a result of his brother's death in the plane crash. Mm -hmm. And you must remember that Randolph felt uh, responsible for Philip's death. Uh -huh. And afterward, during his blackout, see, well, he really thought that he was, Phil, huh? Exactly. Of course, you were taking a big chance, Mr. Dollar. This new shock might have killed him. Oh, but don't I know it, Doc. But, you know, when I suddenly realized what it was all about, I... Well, fortunately, it worked. His intense excitement, which ordinarily might have resulted in another one of his blackouts, sent him back into the Phil personality. Well, that excitement, plus the shock and pain when you struck him, then his overpowering fear when you stood over him, pulling that trigger, apparently trying to kill him. Well, Dollar, they were a perfect match for the pain and the terror that existed during the plane crash that made him the way he was. Hmm. But now, Doctor... Well, I believe, I'm convinced that with proper care, Randolph will now be all right. Will be himself, entirely. Good. Just, uh, don't you ever try anything like this again, young man. Yeah, Dr. Parsons was right. After this, I'll leave the shock treatment bit to people like him who really know what they're doing. All right, let's see now. Expense account total comes to $196.55. They'll 
be no fee on this one. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were G. Stanley Jones, Frank Gerstle, James McCallion, Jack Moyles, Herb Ellis, and Russell Thorson. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is John Wall speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.